Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Human Geography by Dorell and Henderson. This is a lecture summary of Chapter 4 on Folk and Popular Culture. After being a little disorganized on Chapter 3, a little bit here and there, I'm happy to say that Chapter 4 uh, is pretty straightforward. I'll be running pretty much through the sections of the text in order and embellishing a little, adding a little here and there, skipping a few things as well, of course, but uh, I hope doing a fair shake uh, of covering the content in the chapter in a, in a reasonable way. So let's get into it without further ado and talk about the broad outline. For this first lecture, I'm gonna try and get through at least through folk culture and maybe into the changing cultural landscape. So not quite halfway, uh, but we're gonna talk about this big idea of the cultural landscape. It's gonna take a, more of our time because it's a really important idea that we'll come back to in later chapters as well. So it's one of my personal favorites. And so we're gonna em emphasize that a little bit as we go here. Let's get into it. Let's talk about when, when we talk about culture, we can think about all kinds of things. Some people think about culture as something that's like a uh, fine arts or um, kind of a, the, 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 the customs around high culture, if you will, like how you, how you um, set the table and that kind of thing, or the way you don't put your um, elbows on the table if, you're, um, if that's a rule of your eating place, right? Uh, but when we talk about culture and geography, we're not talking about something that people have or they don't. Everyone has culture, and we can uh, divide the idea of what culture is a couple different ways. First of all, culture consists of different technologies. So the way that we decide we're going to grow our food and the way that we, uh, the foods that we decide we're going to eat or not eat um, are part of our culture. And so food culture is a big part of culture, obviously, because of that. But so is agriculture in itself, the idea of whether we um, have the technology to farm with tractors and have very few farmers or farm with uh, hand implements and maybe some animal power and have a lot of farmers. That's part of what makes up our culture. Uh, music, obviously, is part of a technological element of culture. We need to have musical instruments to perform music, but... We don't need to have the same musical instruments as another culture. In fact, the musical instruments that we think of as musical instruments dictate to some extent the kind of musical sounds that we make and the kind of music that we, that we, um, that we think of as being music. And then things like the internet are also part of culture as well. So that's a really, if this sounds like broad enough to be almost everything, then yes, <laughs> you've got it. It is, right? But not just technology in terms of the practices or tools that we use. Culture also encompasses material goods, sometimes called anthropologically, sometimes a material artifact, an artifact of culture, uh, but we can also just say material goods. Things like the clothing that we wear, so whether we have a collared shirt on or a t-shirt, right? Um, our housing, the kinds of houses we live in, the, whether we make our houses from brick or from wood, or from some other material, from bamboo, for example. And then things like recreation are also are part of our material goods. So uh, whether we have particular um, equipment that we use for skiing, for example, or a soccer ball and a set of goals, all of this is part of our material culture as well. And then we have culture that we can think of as different ways of living or different ways of relating to others in the world. And that includes things like our family organization. When we think of our family, do we think of our closest nuclear family as just the parents and children? Or do we think about family in a broader context of parents and uh, aunts and uncles and grandparents and maybe all living close together or even under the same roof? These are different ways of thinking about close family, right? Um, political institutions are also part of culture, which we're going to get to when we get to a different chapter on political geography. So there's all these different dimensions that we can think of um, in culture. And then last but not least here are different ways of thinking and acting with culture. And so, um, you know, acting sounds a little bit weird in this context, but uh, the, our behaviors are more than just what we think about. It's also the way we um, observe our, our beliefs, right? So 
going to a church or a synagogue or a, or a mosque is an act of what we think about the right way to behave is based on a religion, for example. Uh, the words that we speak, the words that we um, understand from other people is an element of our culture because culture um, is given meaning by communication in a lot of cases. So language is part of culture as well. So if, if now you're thinking, wow, what's not culture, then <laughs> you've got a good idea about what culture is when we think about it in, in terms of what geographers are interested in about culture. For this chapter, we really drill down and look at mostly at material culture. So we're looking at the things that we, that we use, the clothing that we wear, the houses that we live in, uh, overlapping into technologies of culture a little bit as well, but really not looking at these last two categories of culture. We're going to do those in later chapters. We'll be looking at political institutions in a, a chapter on political geography. We have a different chapter on the geography of world religion and also a chapter on the geography of languages. So, uh, which is good because there's way too much to cover in just one chapter if we keep it that way. So we're going to be looking at these things for culture, mostly, especially material goods. Why do we care about culture and geography if it's everything that humans do everywhere? Well, uh, one reason is because we learn our culture from somewhere. And sometimes we have it transmitted to us from people in a close family relationship. We learn our culture from our parents, for example. But we also learn culture from other influences outside of, for example, our family structure. And that's interesting, and that's important from a geographic standpoint when we talk about globalization, which we will plenty in this chapter. And it's also reproduced. So we see culture as something that, unless it's repeated, unless it's reproduced, it would die out. And that's something, the reproduction of culture is something that has been changing lately, and that has an interesting geographic dimension to it. So that's one reason we're really focused uh, on the geography of folk and popular culture as a point of interest for the 21st century. And then this seems a little obvious, almost trite to say, but ge geographic similarities and differences in culture are everywhere. And understanding the differences between different uh, part types of culture and different cultural modes of reproduction can help us understand those patterns that we observe. This is one of the things that makes people think about geography as an interesting subject. When we travel the world, we see different people practicing different cultures in different places. And that is part of what makes the world a really amazingly diverse and interesting place to, to live in and participate in and be a part of. So that's another reason to, to be really interested in the geography of culture. Let's get into some of the differences now between, on the one hand, folk culture, and on the other hand, popular culture. So these two divisions, this, this cultural division between folk and popular culture are, are really stark. Now, in real life, there might be some folk cultures that are a little more popular or some popular cultures that are a little more folk, or maybe popular culture that's taking a little bit from folk and borrowing it, co-opting it maybe. That's all true and possible. We're going to separate them and treat them like they're completely different uh, just to understand the differences because there are some cultures that are really super folk and then some cultures that are really super popular. And so understanding the, the characteristics of both of those types helps us understand the differences between them. Let's get into it. Folk culture tends to be reliant on local materials. So an example I just gave of housing as an, as an element of material culture. Uh, in a folk culture, local materials might include something like if you were in the Great Plains uh, in two, 200 years ago, you might make your house out of sod, out of cut grass. If you are living in Southeast Asia, it's entirely possible that more bamboo will be involved in the construction of your housing. <clears throat> if you're in the Pacific Northwest, like around Green River College, chances are good that your house is made out of uh, wood from the plentiful forests nearby. Whereas if you go to the American Southwest, like Arizona or New Mexico, it's much less common to see wood used and more common for buildings to be made, maybe with some wood involved in, in some structural components, but a lot more brickwork and poured concrete work. 
So local materials tend to be a characteristic of folk cultures because folk cultures are based on their place that they're from. Folk cultures also rely more, more on local knowledge. That is the people who live in an area know that environment very well and know how to live in it in their particular cultural response. A folk culture usually develops over many, many generations in a particular place. And therefore local knowledge is really important for understanding the relationship between people and their environment. I just said this indirectly, but here it is again. Uh, folk culture relies then on local environments. So that relationship of people to the environment is closely intertwined and people don't tend to ignore the environment in a folk culture. They tend to understand it and live in some kind of a relationship with it. Maybe not always harmonious, but at least acknowledging, acknowledging its existence. Folk culture is largely based on a, the idea of tradition. That is that it is maintained over time. It's passed from generation to generation. And so therefore it tends not to change very much from a parent's generation to the next generation, to the children's generation. Uh, for example, a clothing custom that is, that is pr practiced by a, a, an older generation is likely to get passed to the next generation without much change. Whereas clearly in popular culture, that doesn't happen very often, right? We observe that folk cultures change from place to place. As we travel across a landscape, as we travel across the world, there are many different folk cultures. So if I go to Ecuador, for example, we'll see some photos from Ecuador later in this chapter. Uh, if I go to Ecuador, I will see very different folk cultures than if I visit, say, northern Canada, or if I visit Japan. And so the cultural expression changes from place to place a lot. But as I already mentioned, because folk culture tends to be traditional and passed on through generations, we don't observe it changing as much over time. So folk culture is, is traditional in the sense that it tends to be self-perpetuating and repeated again and again and again in the same sort of way, maybe changing a little over time, but not a lot over time. Finally, folk cultures tend to be homemade. And so, for example, when we talk about the clothing that folk cultures um, favor, sometimes they, they home make their uh, clothing or maybe, maybe have a weaving tradition as part of the culture where the traditional folk cultural blankets, for example, are hand woven um, or made at home. And so lots of different elements to this. Um, food, for example, a lot, a lot of folk cultures have a rich food tradition, including the preparation of food from raw ingredients, not store-bought ingredients. So homemade is a big element of that. Let's contrast those features of folk culture reproduction, the characteristics of what makes folk culture folk culture with popular culture. Now, for those of you who are watching this presentation on the internet, <laughs> you are well aware of what popular culture is because you're Im Im immersed in it. This is a online lecture. So here we are, this is popular culture. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, popular culture incorporates materials from many places, not necessarily local places. So while I gave the examples of local sourced building materials, it's still possible to build houses out of whatever you want based on your own fancy, based on what, you, what your own preference is. Um, and that's true when it comes to things that are uh, smaller and easier to transport than housing in particular. Popular culture tends to rely on expert knowledge over local knowledge. And we're not trying to make a value judgment here about experts versus locals. It's a, just a difference. It's that when, when we talk about popular culture, we're talking about something that is, generally speaking, widespread and mass produced. And so the people who are our leaders on popular culture are experts in whatever domain they, they, um, they make. So let me give you a quick example of this. Um, when we talk about, for example, agriculture, we're talking about local knowledge here of someone who knows just how to farm using hand tools and maybe animal power in their own local environment. And that is an incredibly valuable skill. Whereas if we talk about um, agricultural technology from a pop culture perspective, then we're really talking about uh, hybridized seeds, 
developed in a laboratory and tractors developed by uh, mechanical engineers, right? Uh, and so it's there. there's clearly one is much more expensive and has much more impact on the environment. That's, but this is what the difference we're talking about with respect to sort of expert knowledge versus local knowledge. Popular culture tends to spread across many environments instead of being tied into the local environment. And for that reason, popular culture can actually ignore some environmental conditions. An example of this that I'd like to give sometimes is how golf courses exist everywhere in the world. Golf courses are an example of a popular sport. And we see golf courses in the desert. We see golf courses in the grasslands. We see golf courses in the forested areas. And it doesn't matter where, where people want to have a golf course. They'll set up a golf course and they will plant grass in the desert and put a ton of water on it so that it stays green. Or they'll cut the trees down in the forest and um, make the fairways so that you can play golf in the forest. Or they'll put the golf course up on the grasslands like it was when they started playing golf in Scotland. The environment is less important to popular culture, to the expression of that culture. In contrast, so in, in contrast to the traditional nature of folk culture, we see popular culture is continuously reinvented. Uh, the reason for this is because it's, and let me get my head out of the way. I'm sorry, I just realized my, my, my face was... Uh, there we go. Uh, and so uh, pop culture tends to not be traditional. It tends to be new, new, new. So pop culture is constantly being reinvented and recreated, even variations from year to year, um, but especially from generation to generation. Uh, young people today do not dress anything like young people did 10 years ago, um, and much less they don't dress very much like their parents. So that's the idea of reinventing popular culture over time. In contrast to folk culture, we see that popular culture, because it's continuously reinvented, changes from time to time. The musical tastes of the 1980s are different than the musical tastes of the 1990s, are different than the musical tastes of the 2000s, are different than the musical tastes of the 2020s. So we see it changing from time to time, but less change from place to place, less across space. And so what we talked about here in folk culture was that folk culture, when we move across the world, we see different folk cultures. We encounter different expressions of culture everywhere we go, whereas popular culture doesn't tend to vary as much from place to place. Let me give you an example. I just gave you the golf example, which is that you can play golf uh, in most countries in the world and they all have 18 holes on a full golf course. There's no golf courses that say, we're going to do 20 holes or 16 holes, right? There are still small golf courses that have nine holes, um, just like there are in the U.S. and Scotland as well, right? But um, the standard golf course is a standard golf course, and um, most holes are par three or par four at a lot of these golf courses. So this is, a, uh, this is one of the things that we see where – popular culture tends to be a little more homogenous. It tends to be more the same than it's different. We see this with popular music, for example, as well, which is that um, the, the pop songs of the 2020s um, sound similar and are played on popular music stations everywhere in the United States and a lot of places in Europe and Canada all at once. And then the next hit song comes out and it's played everywhere all at once. And then last but not least, far from least, in contrast to the homemade nature of folk culture, we see popular culture as much more store-bought. And this is an important point to emphasize because this underlines the commercial production nature of popular culture. Popular culture tends to be something that's based on getting money, getting resources, and selling things as part of commercial production. It's because of that that it's continuously reinvented, and there's a lot of pressure to have it be widespread in its use across many environments. All that is about making more money. So let's get into some of these elements of culture and uh, move on to the cultural landscape as a concept. I love this concept. I get really excited about it. 
if there's something I really hope that you take uh, from this, this course and learn well and think about in the years to come, I hope it, this is one of the things you think about is the cultural landscape idea. The cultural landscape is a an idea that sometimes sometimes we call this idea one of cultural ecology. I introduced this idea already in chapter one, uh, and our our textbook didn't use the term cultural ecology in chapter one, but it, it, it talked about it. Talked about environmental determinism and possibilism, but the idea of cultural ecology is the interrelationship between people and their environment. And we've got this nice little diagram from our textbook here that shows culture influencing the landscape and then the landscape influencing culture and on and on. The idea of the cultural landscape is that people everywhere they go, everywhere they live, even if they live at a very low impact way, modify their environment in some way. It might be relatively slight modifications. It might be really extreme modifications, but humans as, as, as the people that we are like to modify the environment, we like to cut down trees, we like to build dams, we like to um, put roads in places, we like to make uh, fields for our sports, right? So we tend to make the landscape reflect what we think is important, what our dominant culture thinks is important, I should say. There are lots of different cultures within um, one particular cultural group, but the dominant culture likes to impose what it sees as the way a landscape should look onto the landscape. However, the landscape also determines a little bit about what choices the culture has. Not, not too strongly, if you remember the discussion from chapter one about this, but the landscape can set some limits on the expression of culture. And so this interrelationship then is a really interesting one to think about. Because when we go out into any landscape, I'm not talking about a beautiful landscape. I mean any landscape. If we walk out into a just general street someplace in western Washington, in the middle of a city or the middle of a suburb, that is a cultural landscape. The houses that we've chosen to build, the size of the houses, the width of the streets, whether the sidewalks in the streets or not whether there's parking for cars or not very much parking for cars, whether there's a lot of lawns in front of the houses or a lot of bushes in front of the houses. Every single thing that you see in one of those environments was made by a cultural choice. Somebody said, this is what a house should look like. This is what a street should look like. This is what a lawn should look like or what a yard should look like. All those little choices reflect a dominant culture and that in turn is shown in the landscape. So we can tell a lot about a culture by just looking at the landscape. Now, before we get into this too far, I wanna make sure we refresh our memory of the idea of environmental determinism compared to possibilism. We went into this at length in chapter one, uh, but to remind ourselves, environmental determinism is the idea that the landscape causes culture. So it's just this arrow and it's a really strong arrow. The idea is that people's culture reflects only the landscape they live in. And uh, as we discussed in chapter one, we've largely rejected that notion. What we've uh, accepted instead is the idea of possibilism, which is the landscape can set some limits on cultural expression, but people can also modify their landscape and people's culture is versatile and flexible enough to allow for many different possibilities. So for example, if it's too hot, we can turn on the AC or we can take a break during the hottest part of the day in what's called a siesta in Spain, for example. If it's too cold, we can uh, wear warmer clothes or we can turn up the heat. And um, if, it's, if we wanna go ice skating in summer, we can build an indoor, um, indoor skating rink. If we want to go swimming in winter, we can build an indoor pool. So there's lots of different ways that culture can adapt the landscape to its cultural desires with some constraints on time and money, obviously. And there's also ways in which the landscape gives gentle nudges or pushes towards cultural expression uh, one way or the other. So I hope that's a, a good quick refresher of these ideas.
All right, moving on to the idea of cultural landscapes now in a little more depth. And I'll probably wrap it up here shortly. We've been going about 20 something minutes. So um, I'll, I'll probably wrap it up um, here and then we'll get into some folk cultural landscapes and popular cultural landscapes in the next, next lecture. Um, but let's talk about the big idea of cultural landscapes and some differences that we see in the world today. Our book does a nice job here of presenting the biggest gulfs, the biggest differences in, in terms of like what we see when we look at a cultural landscape. Uh, and they, they point out, and I think this is, I, I agree with this, this is a great, great observation, that uh, first of all, the a big difference we observe is between globalized popular cultural landscapes and localized folk cultural landscapes. So think about this as a difference of like being inside of a mall, which is a globalized pop culture landscape, and uh, being in a small rural village in say Tanzania, right? So that's a localized folk cultural landscape. So the, the buildings will be made of mud brick, the roofs will be made of um, wood um, cane and thatch um, roof, and uh, people use lo local materials, the farms will be growing the crops that will grow well in that environment, whereas in a mall um, or a Walmart, stuff comes from all around the world for people to buy. Uh, the idea of the place that you're in is about consumption, not about just living. Uh, and so this contrast is quite stark, quite, quite dramatic, right? And then secondly, in terms of cultural landscapes, we see really big differences in the landscape view between rural landscapes and not suburban, but rural landscapes, really out in the countryside and urban landscapes. There's a big difference between a large, dense city and a more, much more rural, more agricultural um, settlement with, with maybe a few hundred people or maybe a thousand people compared to a city of millions. That's a really obvious uh, and stark contrast. So I think I'm going to leave it there. That's a good spot to pause. And I will return in the next lecture talking about folk culture and pop culture attributes again with some cultural landscape examples to illustrate the idea, not just of the cultural landscape, but also of just what folk culture is about as well as popular culture. Thanks so much. I'll see you again soon.